Greetings, squidlings. It has been a while since we have spoken. A swan was spreading pestilence and I had to hit it with a stick. Long story. Regardless, I have returned to the physical realm to discuss how to remove the disgraceful little things making humans sad. What have I found? A digital leaflet. Teach the future. Ooh. Students and pupils want to learn more about the climate crisis. A reasonable request, considering the environmental situation. This got me thinking. It is considered that everyone should have a voice in what affects them. However, in education, the pupil, student, is often the only one who doesn't have a say. Different groups demand students learn different things, and it's not just about skills and knowledge. Values are taught, too. Not necessarily explicitly, but they're taught. Who controls the curriculum controls the future. They decide what knowledge and values are deemed important. So, what future are we making? Let's start with values. I think the best example is the test. The examination. During a test, you answer questions and receive a score out of a number, and then you are graded based on how big your score is. Simple. So what values does this promote? Well, once you reach a certain age, you realise that what grades you get have more to do with percentages than how good you are. The top 10% get the top grade. The next 10% down get the second best, and so on. What that means is you realise that you do better if everyone else does worse. It leads to the situation where you hope everyone else fucks up so that your score becomes comparatively better. And even that analysis assumes the trusts truly do accurately reflect how good you are at X subject. Preparing for a test is not just about knowing things, it's about how good you are at taking tests. Answer what appears to be a straightforward question with a straightforward answer. You lose half the marks because for some reason it was a four mark question and you had to word your answer in a way that was 80% waffle to be able to get top marks. Write too much on a question that's actually interesting, you waste a lot of time. From this example, we see that the values being promoted are competition, self-interest and ignoring the gut feeling that what you are doing is bullshit because if you don't, you're fucked, i.e., Perfect values for workers under capitalism. In addition, you are, at any time, liable to be punished for being autistic, or misunderstanding an instruction, or being autistic, or having shoes slightly more like trainers than is regulation, or having ADHD, or being peer pressured by your classmates into doing something mildly silly but basically harmless. It frankly says a lot that most people seem to hate school when, in a just world, Going to a thing dedicated to putting knowledge in your brain should be the best thing ever. School also assumes a one-size-fits-all approach to learning. There are many people who struggled with a subject at school, but loved it the moment they did it in another context, or in a different way. Many people hate or suck at, for example, algebra, because of their experiences in school, but after a fairly quick conversation with me, think it maybe wasn't as bad as they thought. They also seem not to like my remedies for the pestilence. I don't get it. A urine bath works every time. People bathe in urine one time and they never need my help again. And what of the curriculum? Well, in Britain, it's often criticised for being colonialist as fuck. The current history curriculum, for example, was designed by Michael Gove because he wanted people to stop being so negative about the British Empire. The current focus on colonial history is about the beginning and the end of it which conveniently removes the ongoing impacts of colonialisation and also the parts that involved strapping rebels to the mouths of cannons. There is often little to no mention of the contributions of people who aren't white or straight. And finally, schools are designed as fundamentally hierarchical. While the teachers usually don't have any more power over what is taught than the kids do, and are often overworked and underpaid, they also have one thing over the children. They have the power to enforce the rules. It is often observed that people who get good grades will get away with things that less academically inclined people will get put in detention for. Bullying regularly goes undealt with, and if the teacher does something abusive, who do you turn to? So, that's the current state of things. How do we fix it? Well, changing the curriculum is relatively easy, but liable to be reversed the moment a right-wing government is in power. Again, controlling education means controlling the future. You could increase funding for teaching assistance to provide support for neurodivergent students, 
but that doesn't work if the overall classroom environment is counterproductive to that method of learning, and other attempts tend to lead to neurodivergent children being segregated into special schools. And all of our attempts at reform are still based on the same premise, that children don't know what they should learn, that coercing children into learning is the only way. Non-coercive education is scary, chaotic, unknown, but this is the void. We thrive in chaos here. What would a non-coercive education system look like? What is the theory and what is the practice? Rock a bad baby on the treetop When the wind blows the cradle will rock When the bow breaks the cradle will fall And down will come baby Cradle and all. The fundamental assumption that we are making is that every child knows what is best for themselves. Teachers are there to provide support, answer questions and provide insight when necessary. If learning is climbing a mountain, they are there to provide a leg up when necessary. The rules of the school would be decided on by the collective via vote and both pupils and teachers would get a say. But OK. That's not really the issue. In this system, students would be able to do what they want within the rules decided on. And one of the main responses I got when researching this video is, won't children learn the basics? The basics usually referring to numeracy and literacy. Now, I disagree, as most things a child would want to do requires them to be capable of at least basic numeracy and literacy. For example, let's say a kid just wanted to sit down and play Minecraft normal kid thing, right? Just have fun, building an awkward wood house so the creeper blows up, not learning anything. Well, no. First of all, you have likely learned something from Minecraft, assuming you play it. Do you know what a biome is? I'm not asking for a dictionary definition, but you have a basic idea in your head, right? And I'd guess most of you learned it from Minecraft. But okay, that's trivia in a lot of contexts, but Minecraft can teach you basic reading and arithmetic. For example, Let's say you wanted to build a house out of sandstone. Sandstone is not a material you tend to gather a lot of in the course of normal gameplay, so you'd have to go out and get some. Okay, the house is six by eight sandstone and three blocks high. To build a one block high wall for this house, you need 24 blocks. 24 times three is 72. Then you think, oh, minus four blocks for the door, so you need 68 sandstone. Sandstone is quite awkward to get directly, so they've probably mined sand. It takes four sand to craft one sandstone, so you need four lots of 68, which is 272. That's quite a lot of maps. It might take them a while to get the hang of it, but given time, they will probably figure out how to add, multiply, and divide. And something similar could happen for reading. You don't have to have literacy lessons for people to learn literacy. It's prevalent enough in society that interacting with it motivates you to learn it. Lessons regularly teach you more than one thing. For example, media analysis usually requires you to learn the context it was created in, even if that wasn't your goal. The Minecraft example may not work for everyone, but it's not the only way. Learning to cook requires an understanding of ratios, and at least at first, learning to read a recipe. Numbers and words are everywhere, and they call you to them. But okay, you might ask, that's only the theory. What does it look like in practice? What does a democratic school look like? Short answer, it depends. In the democratic school in Hedera, students have five options. Taking a variety of non-compulsory classes on subjects that are co-decided by students and teachers. Learning centres, which are areas of the school dedicated to particular subjects such as art, science, languages, music and so on. These are dedicated to independent study, where a student can research a particular subject with intensity personal agreements, which is where a student studies something off campus because the school doesn't have the resources to allow the student to study it properly. So in other words, I promise I'll do the learning if you let me go look at dinosaur bones. The fourth one is a more formal variant on the previous. And finally, workshops, which anyone could arrange. There is also time and space for play, which, fun fact, is a human right. I don't know about non-human children. Do they have rights? At the Circle School in the US, they offer traditional methods of learning, classes, one-on-one -on -one study, etc., organised by the students. But what appears to be the focus are interest groups of different students getting together to learn about the common area of interest. Think of it as a slightly more formal book club, but not necessarily about books. 
students are also allowed to start corporations which are dedicated to organising a certain thing and raising money to allow the thing to happen. This has capitalism in it, which is bad, but right now we just have to deal with that. They may be organised slightly different ways, but they both have stuff in common. One, a system where both staff and children vote on the school rules to make sure no cannibalism or stabbery happens. Two, an emphasis on mutual learning. Children learn from other children and teachers learn from children just as much as children learn from teachers. Plot twist, children have their own insights to bring to the table. Three, the understanding that different changelings learn in different ways. So what about the three R's? Well, from everything I've read, upon leaving school, children have literacy and numeracy skills at levels comparable to traditional schooling. The main difference is that when in their schooling they develop, these skills is different. This makes sense. People develop different skills at different ages. Do you know someone who could read adult level books really young but never developed social skills because by the time they were ready to, they lost access to any resources to help them? That happens the other way around. This is why these schools tend to implement age mixing. Age is a really arbitrary way of measuring development, given that people are ready to develop different skills at different times. This means that a 10-year-old might be in the same class as a 15-year-old, and there is no shame in that. Now, an individual who I'm going to refer to as Tank Engine made an interesting point. They said that more than basic skills are necessary. More complex skills like media analysis, historical literacy and science are important in any context. So thanks, Tank Engine. Tentacles up for the void. Now, I know Tank Engine isn't talking about getting kids into X subject. Kids get into history when they watch Matthew Baton singing about how he isn't remotely dandy while exhibiting the biggest dandy energy since John Pertwee played the Doctor. Anyone who has been within 100 kilometres of a school knows this. They're talking about stuff like how to spot fake news, how capitalist business decisions affect video games, how to read studies to make sure you're not being BS, and what is the context for that statue of Oliver Cromwell outside Parliament and why is my Irish friend a bit uncomfy with that? Now, while I will say that it is not in the capitalist system's best interest to answer those questions honestly as part of a curriculum, just the first one would mean no one would ever buy the sun again, and God forbid politicians not get those tasty donations. But as to how to solve those questions within a democratic context, I don't know. I'm a void creature, not omniscient. My best answer would be to train teachers in these skills and so they can help students not learn bad research practices, which I'm a plague doctor, not an educator. I don't know how that would work in practice. But that's the thing we all fear about democracy, isn't it? What if people make the wrong decision? The response to that is simple. What if the authority makes the wrong decision? There is risk in any system. You just have to choose how you dance with the chaos. Now, all of these schools exist within capitalism and thus are subject to capitalism's pressures of must prepare students for job and must not let people eat the rich, which is very rude and not what we're about. But the fact that these schools exist and are treating children and as individuals rather than as future cogs in the machine says a lot. Part of the promise of a void utopia is that people are truly free to express their individuality, not in a can customise your uniform way, but in a have the time and resources to develop whatever skills and hobbies will form them into the best version of themselves. By removing exams, we allow true solidarity to form amongst children, maybe by removing other types of competition that can be life or death. We allow solidarity to form amongst other groups of people. By allowing children to choose what they learn, free from coercion, they learn that what they do matter and that what they choose matters. They learn that they can organise together to make their lives better. I wonder how these ideas might affect their world they grow into. What values do you want to matter? Maybe we can let the kids decide.